In an obscure passage tucked away in the scolium of his famous work Principia Mathematica, Isaac Newton left an ominous and cryptic warning to his readers. Relative quantities are not the quantities themselves, whose names they bear, but sensible measures of them. And by the names time, space, place, and motion, their sensible measures are to be understood. And the expression will be unusual if the measured quantities themselves are meant. Those violate the accuracy of language who interpret these words for the measured quantities. Nor do those less defile the purity of mathematical and philosophical truths who confound real quantities with their relations and sensible measures. This strange and dire paragraph appears to be cautioning its reader against making some dangerous philosophical misstep, some type of erroneous conflation in reasoning. But of what sort exactly? It turns out understanding the nature of Newton's warning here is no inconsequential task, because some 200 years after he issued it, a 26-year-old graduate of the Polytechnic Institute in Zurich, and the only individual in his class to not receive an assistantship position upon graduation, would precisely fail to heed this warning, and subsequently plunge the philosophy of modern physics into total freefall. 120 years later, it will be us who pays the price. All and everything we do in physics relies on physical processes of measurement. But despite this, what measurement is and actually means still remains one of the most philosophically underdeveloped branches of science. Even today, people take for granted that they understand what a measurement is telling them, often overlooking or failing altogether to recognize all sorts of hidden implicit assumptions that any process of measurement carries with it. For instance, say you want to make a very basic type of measurement, a measurement of velocity. This measurement would seem to require only four simple pieces of information. Two measurements of spatial displacement and two readings of temporal durations. Easy, right? Well, no, because to acquire this information in the first place, you also need several additional equally important things. 1. A clear and precise understanding of what is meant by the concepts of spatial position and temporal duration in the first place. And 2. What could be termed an engineering solution for the coordination of those spatio-temporal concepts to the functionings of actual physical objects. Such solutions should be readily familiar to most individuals. For instance, we can engineer a measure of time via the position of the sun in the sky. The higher the sun is in the sky, the closer it is to noon. The closer the sun is to the horizon, the closer it is to morning or night. The spatial displacement of the sun in the sky thus represents the passage of time. Another familiar solution is the marking out of time via the well-regulated cycling of a system of wound-up gears in a clock or watch. Where a certain number of gear cycles gives us a second, a minute, an hour, etc. But of course, neither the position of the sun in the sky nor the number of revolutions of gears in a clock are what we mean when we say time itself. The reason for this should be fairly apparent. The gears of any clock will eventually stop moving. And the Earth's rotation, which causes the Sun's displacement across the sky, features a number of irregularities ultimately making it unsuitable for very precise timekeeping. 
Thus, it would be absurd to assert that the stopping of the gears of a clock meant that time itself had stopped. Or that, say, the slowing of the rotation of the Earth somehow meant that time itself was slowing down. Holding this fact in mind, let's revisit the cautionary language of Newton's aforementioned paragraph and see if we can make some sense of it. Consider first the opening line. Relative quantities are not the quantities themselves whose names they bear, but sensible measures of them. Here it seems Newton would be distinguishing between two types of time. There's first what he would probably term relative time. The sort of time that could be engineered from, say, distinguishing the position of the sun at different points in the sky. Indeed, an hour of time on Earth is generally marked out by the sun traveling a 15-degree arc length path through the sky. But this 15-degree arc length path isn't an hour of time itself. That is, it isn't what Newton would distinguish as actual or absolute time. Rather, instead, this would be what Newton terms the measured quantity. So this measured quantity of the passage of the sun through a 15-degree arc length qualifies in Newton's thinking as relative time. And as he further writes, it's meant to be what he calls a sensible measure of actual time. The meaning of sensible lends itself pretty readily here. The displacement of the sun in the sky is a sensible choice as a physical stand-in for time because it's extraordinarily regular and for the most part it doesn't change. Now in this context, the meaning of Newton's warning should seem more self-evident. When we say time, we mean the idealistic stand-in of a perfectly regular process, which itself is never subject to alteration by any other physical processes. And since something like the displacement of the sun in the sky is both caused and affected by other ongoing physical processes, it cannot be what we mean when we say the words time itself and thus should not, according to Newton's writing, be interpreted that way. So what does all this have to do with Einstein? Well, Einstein was very influenced by the philosophy of the Austrian physicist Ernst Mach, who essentially believed that if something isn't observable, that if it can't be measured, then, well, it shouldn't be regarded as real. Indeed, the Machian argument against Newtonian space and time goes along the lines that, since absolute space and time aren't observables, our laws of physics shouldn't contain references to them. This argument, of course, long predates Mach and has many a time proved very persuasive to very many people including even ourselves at one point. However, the argument itself hinges on some very problematic notions of how words like observable or measurement can even be defined in the first place. Indeed, Einstein, compelled by Mach's ideas, sought to make time and space into what he thought would fit the bill of an observable quantity. But by doing such, he actually committed the very error Newton had warned against. That is, he sought out a physical process, a measured quantity, to serve as a stand-in for time itself. Now to his credit, Einstein chose this measured quantity to be the displacement of light between two given endpoints. A wise decision since, to the best of our knowledge, Light is the agent which is responsible for the transmission of causal information. And hence, most every temporal process that occurs in our universe is at some level a light clock. But Einstein made a huge error in doing this, for he failed to account for the fact that light itself, even in a vacuum, is still a physical thing, and hence that it could be influenced by other physical processes, known or unknown. 
Indeed, just like defining time as the passage of the sun through a certain arc length path in the sky, defining time as the passage of light between certain endpoints in space would be a terrible definition if it turned out some other physical process, known or unknown, could affect the motion of that light during its passage. Indeed, earlier we mentioned it would be absurd to assert that time had stopped because the gears of your clock stopped moving, or because the Earth stopped rotating. Yet, it is without a sense of absurdity that we make such statements all the time in relativity. Time stops at the event horizon of a black hole. Time stops if you are traveling at the speed of light. But if light is a physical thing and affected by other physical processes, then this is, precisely as Newton put it, a clear violation of language. Time itself does not stop. Clocks do. Now, there are many out there who naively argue that this is the essential point of relativity. That we are ultimately stuck with measured quantities in physics. So why bother with idealistic stand-ins? Hence, one might feel Newton was being dramatic in declaring that by adopting such practices, as Einstein did, that we would be defiling philosophical truths. Some clocks tick faster or slower than others. So what? Great. We keep track of which clocks are affected and under what circumstances, and then all is good, right? Well, no. Because it gets worse. So, so, so much worse. Returning to the Earth for a second, let's say we wanted to claim that the sun's passage through the sky is what actually defines time. Just as Einstein claimed in his famous 1905 paper that a light beam's passage in an inertial frame is what actually defines time. Well, the only way you could maintain that position is by denying that there is any causal origin for the sun's movement in the first place. That is, you would have to posit that the sun's daily displacement in the sky was an innate brute fact of nature. The result of, say perhaps, an intrinsic sky geometry. That, although it could be readily mapped out with precise mathematical relations, could not be determined to be rooted in anything deeper. Because as soon as you try to do that, you would be admitting that the sun's passage was not truly time itself, but something more vulgar and physically dependent. Likewise, to define time as the displacement of light through an inertial reference frame, Einstein had to make this phenomenon a causal meaning he had to posit that the behavior of light in inertial frames was just a brute fact of reality with no deeper underlying origin. And since his aim was to force Maxwell's equations to have the same form in every inertial frame of reference, he had to do this for every inertial observer, no matter what their speed was relative to each other. The different notions of time and space constructed by various observers in different frames, could then be connected via very precise mathematical relations, which, along with the frame invariance of light itself, was soon interpreted to be nothing more than the consequences of an intrinsic Lorentzian geometry which supposedly structures our reality. Now, if you denied that the sun's passage in the sky was caused by anything deeper, that is, if you elevated it to the status of a postulate, even though you could always describe the sun's position and behavior with utter mathematical precision, you would never be able to develop a proper model of Earth and its rotation in space, or of the solar system as a whole. Because you'd be hamstrung trying to fit every new observation and every new phenomenon into the idea that the sun's displacement is something fixed and absolute. Likewise, by denying that light behavior within a light clock can be influenced by anything else physical, Einstein effectively handicapped our models of physics. 
forcing our subsequent theories to be confined to some very narrow range of ideas. And therein lies the very great, very unrecognized danger of relativity. Indeed, today most physics students are taught that the phenomena of relativity, such as time dilation and length contraction, are nothing more than the consequences of the one-way invariance of light, and that, as such, they have no further causal origin. But this is a complete untruth. For there are many models of relativity we can make, which are consistent with the empirical invariance of the two-way speed of light, as determined by experiments like the Michelson-Morley one, but which do not feature Einstein's invariant and isotropic one-way light. And guess what? In every single one of these non-invariant anisotropic light models, time dilation and length contraction still occur. But here's the final, real kicker. Out of all of these models, there's precisely one, and only one, in which time dilation and length contraction can be explained with causal mechanisms. And that is the model in which we once again adopt Newton's notion of space and time. Now, there's a lot more to be said on this subject. If at this point you're scratching your head wondering what the difference between two-way and one-way light invariance is, well, we're going to have to double back a bit. Remember when we said a measurement of velocity wasn't such a simple thing after all? Well, we were referring to a one-way velocity, which requires being measured with two separate clocks, as opposed to a two-way averaged velocity, which requires only one clock. Now, to obtain your four spatiotemporal values for calculating this one-way velocity, not only do you need clocks and rods that, in a best-case scenario, are theoretically unaffected by any other physical processes, but you need your two spatially separated clocks to be perfectly synchronized. Because desynchronized clocks give false measurement readings. But as it turns out, it's impossible to ever know if two spatially separated clocks are actually ever synchronized. Something officially known as the one-way speed of light problem. Now, Einstein clearly did understand the importance of having synchronized clocks, and how without them, one cannot make any real measurements in the first place. But his belief that time is nothing more than what clocks measure, that is, his conflation of measured quantities with time itself, led him to make what will likely go down in history as one of the greatest errors in human judgment. When, in regards to synchronizing two spatially separated clocks, A and B, he wrote the following statement. We have not defined a common time for A and B, for the latter cannot be defined at all unless we establish, by definition, that the time required by light to travel from A to B equals the time it requires to travel from B to A. Indeed, in our subsequent installment, we'll dive deep into this erroneous statement and dissect Einstein's misguided justification for it. Because this problem of unsynchronizable clocks, i.e. the one-way speed of light problem, lies at the core of all relativity. And once you've mastered an understanding of it, almost every mystery of the theory quickly unfolds including just what other physical processes are affecting a light beam's passage between two inertial endpoints, and consequently why phenomena like time dilation and length contraction occur in the first place. Moreover, it leads to an understanding of how the entire symmetry of relativity, i.e. Lorentzian invariance, stems not from inherent features of reality, but rather from issues of language, measurement, and consciousness. But for now, we'll merely end this video with a note of renewed appreciation for the incredible foresight possessed by our forefather of physics, Isaac Newton. 
For not only did he anticipate that someone like Einstein would come along, conflate relative measures with absolute ideals, and subsequently obfuscate all of physics, but he also wrote that the doing of such would lead to mathematical expressions that were unusual. And what could be more unusual than the Lorentz transformations? For today, students are taught that these variables somehow represent space and time themselves. Rather than realizing, even in the context of proper time and space, that they're just basic measured quantities. And the confusions and misconceptions which have abounded ever since the adoption of this mindset are near infinite. And by gosh, they will take a great deal of time to sort out. But we're in this for the long haul, so stick with us because there's many a revelation coming. Until soon, this has been Dialect. Thanks for watching.